So last week, I suggested that you might write on your note sheet something significant from the Bible text or something, a comment that was made that you uh, found useful, and then how you could apply it uh, in your life. And so I, I will remind you of this each, each week because the idea I'm trying to encourage is that we find practical application of the texts that we are looking at and use that increased knowledge we have for changing our behavior. I also ended last week asking you to think about three or four things that Mark presents about Jesus that show how Jesus is qualified to be a leader of disciples and a savior of the world. Perhaps you had a chance to look at that. I started by giving you one thing that Mark had done that shows that uh, Jesus, in fact, is qualified. Do you remember what that one was? First one was about prophecy. Uh, prophets spoke about Jesus, and we looked in chapter one, and there were two in particular. Our texts refer to Isaiah, a passage that is found in Isaiah 40, verses three through five. But before Mark quoted that, he quotes Malachi chapter three, verse one. So uh, those are two things that would be especially confirmational to Jewish people because they're looking for a Messiah who is a fulfillment of prophecy. But what does he do for, for others, for example, who are, who are not necessarily Jewish? What else does he say here that could be used as a confirmation or an assurance that uh, Jesus is qualified to be a discipler uh, and a savior? Anybody find anything? Okay, chapter one. You might also have included, besides the fact that prophets pointed to him, that in his baptism, something unusual happened. What unusual happened in his baptism? The Spirit came down, okay? And God spoke, all right, and what did he say? This is my son in whom I am well pleased. So uh, this was a powerful confirmation of who Jesus is. Now we know from the other gospels that there were people there who were watching what was going on and, and probably heard what was said, but even to see the event itself would be uh, quite dramatic. And so from a historical point of view, Mark is recording an event which would confirm who Jesus is. Did you notice anything else there? What else do we talk about besides his baptism? His temptation. How did his temptation give confirmation that he could be a discipler and a savior? Yeah? Yes, he would be uh, qualified as a savior because he didn't give in to any of Satan's temptations. Over 40 days of temptations, he did not give in uh, to the temptation of, uh, of, of Satan, so he did not sin. But he also is an encourager of, of us as disciples um, because he shows us that there is a way. Now, Mark's gospel isn't so detailed, but if you look at the other uh, gospels, how did Jesus respond to Satan? with the scripture. Uh, and so there are examples in the gospels of how we can uh, follow in the, uh, the path of Jesus and find ability to overcome the difficulties that are part of in the, living in this world. There's one other thing that is useful to, to keep in mind. Mark specifically identifies Jesus as whom in verse one? The son of God. He comes right out and says, he's the son of God. And then he lists all these things and all the evidences throughout the rest of the gospel of Mark that would support that, that would show that uh, to be true. And so we can find uh, in Mark's gospel, uh, evidences that would suggest Jesus is qualified to be a discipler and also he's qualified to be a savior. Let's, let's take a look, starting in verse 14. Here we have 
Jesus presenting uh, his gospel. You might say preaching his gospel or teaching his gospel. We, we have here in a summary the gospel that Jesus taught. Let's begin in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this lesson that, that we can have the gospel of Mark that you've provided through the Spirit to Mark that we might understand your son more uh, clearly and carefully and through our knowledge of him and our examination of the evidence and the things that he said as well as what he did, that we can trust him to, to be our Lord and to be our Savior. We pray, Father, that you will grant us wisdom and courage as we share these messages with other people, that we truly can help them have a heart that is open to the truths that we uh, also have found uh, comforting in our lives. We pray, Father, for uh, your mercy even today, and thank you that we've received so much to enjoy in this life. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. So let's read verse 14. Go down chapter 1, verse 14. Mark has now, after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. What triggered Jesus to begin his preaching ministry. What event occurred that triggered Jesus to begin preaching? Yes, John was taken from the scene. Of course, we know from the other gospels what that means. He was arrested. He was taken into custody. Now, why was he taken into custody? Remember, they're, they're at the Jordan River, which is, of course, in Judea, in this part of the region near Jerusalem. Why did they take him into custody? For one thing, he said to Herod that he wasn't supposed to marry his brother's wife. That was a controversy that was of a political nature. Why would they worry about politics? They were in power for a reason. And the reason they were in power is because they didn't cross the path of Rome. All right. So if Herod represented the Roman government and John the Baptist is telling him he can't have his own wife, that might get a little bit uncomfortable. Now, if John the Baptist was a prophet, what should the leaders have done? Maybe persuade Herod not to do that. <laughs> but in this particular uh, case, uh, we find that the fact that John has been arrested, that he's been put into jail, was the point at which Jesus began to preach his gospel. Where does it say Jesus went? He went into Galilee. Now, why would this be a good time, and why Galilee? He's from? He's from there. Mm -hmm. What kind of welcome does he get at home? Oops, we have a proverb from that, don't we? <laughs> What else would be a reason? He was familiar with it, but what would be another reason? If he stayed in Judea or Jerusalem, what could he expect? Hmm? Yes, there would be persecution, hostility, hindrance in preaching the gospel. He had as his, uh, his goal, not simply to die, but to present the kingdom of God to people before he died. And so leaving uh, the region of Judea and going to Galilee uh, was a strategy that enabled him to live long enough to do that. He, he got away from the hostility and the negativity of the leadership in Jerusalem and went to Galilee. And this opportunity provided him with distinction between his message and John's message. Why did there need to be a distinction between the message of Jesus and the message of John? Why, why take this time at this separation to change the message? Listen to him when he comes, and now he's here, so. Yes. John pointed to Jesus and saying his ministry and his person was superior. And so there needed to be a, a clean break between the time when John was preaching his gospel and when Jesus began. Well, actually, John preached what? Yes, what kind? Yes. 
Baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, okay? So he was telling the Jews to repent. Why did they need that message? They were sinners, but in a special way, different from what Jesus was teaching, they were not faithful to their own covenant, to their own law, not even to the, the, the worship that they protected in the temple. So they needed to repent. But like all people, they were sinners. And of course, their baptism through John was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness uh, of sins. John the Baptist would have people who would continue to follow him, even though he said, there's the Lamb of God. So it would be time for his ministry to, to end and people to be pointed to Jesus. Now that's going to take a while. It won't happen immediately because people were devoted to John. You remember when he was in prison, some of his disciples came and asked Jesus a question that John had sent. So there were still people following John, even as Jesus preached the gospel. But this was a clear separation, okay? This was a separation that identified Jesus as the one uh, for whom John had been preparing the way. John the Baptist uh, had opened the, the hearts of many people to the possibility that God was going to begin fulfilling what he'd promised. When was the last time before John that they had had a prophet? Looking at prophets in the Bible, they had some people like the Maccabees that they considered perhaps as prophets. Who was the last prophet? Does anybody remember? Perhaps the one that is quoted, Malachi. It, Jesus quotes Malachi. Malachi was was written approximately 420 years before Christ. Some, you know, there's some variation because Malachi doesn't put any specific uh, anchors in his uh, prophecy, but historically it's somewhere around 420 years. So it's been about 400 years since they have had a prophet. And when John came dressed like a, a, a prophet and speaking like a prophet and acting like a prophet uh, and eating a prophet's diet, they knew that the preparer for the Messiah was at hand, which meant that the Messiah was coming. So they were, John was not sent to establish his own religion or that people would continue to follow him. He came pointing to Jesus. And now is the time to separate and show uh, that Jesus was the one who was a fulfillment of the prophecy. So what do we, we see here? We see that he's going to go to Galilee. That was advantageous for a number of reasons. He was from there, but also um, because there was less hostility there. The focus of the hostility was in, in Judea. What do you know about Galilee besides that Jesus was from there? What do you know about Galilee? People didn't look fondly upon Galilee. People from Galilee were kind of considered backwoods, you know. They were, they were not highly educated. In fact, um, some of the disciples betrayed themselves by their dialect. Probably that was what happened with Peter when he was following John into the place where Jesus was being examined. They could look at him, and, and some of them, of course, were there. The, the young lady who, who recognized him was there, but his voice would give him away. That's a characteristic uh, of their region. They spoke a particular accent. <clears throat> Galilee uh, was not, perhaps, the, the region of, of greatest uh, um, political uh, influence. There weren't as many priests there as there would be uh, in Jerusalem. There were not so many of the leaders coming there to uh, influence the people towards their views, and so this would be a good place to go. So it says in verse 14 that Jesus did what when he went to Galilee? He preached. He preached the gospel of God, all right? Is there a difference between the gospel of God and the gospel of Jesus? Gospel means good news. So what was the good news of God that Jesus would preach? 
I'm here. The Messiah is here. When the Messiah comes, what else comes? Kingdom, because he's what? The king, okay? So the, he's got a message, the gospel uh, from God, and then we will see how that blends into what we call the gospel uh, of Jesus, because they are uh, one and, and the same. What did Jesus say? Uh, look at, let's look at verse 15. Look, as we look through there, what did Jesus say to introduce his gospel? Let's read verse 15. And saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So what did Jesus say to introduce his gospel? Time is fulfilled. He's talking about what? The old is gone, the new is come, and what John had been speaking about was now fulfilled. He mentions the idea uh, of time. And we see in, in Mark's gospel maybe more than in the others because it's shorter. One of the favorite words that, that Mark uses is immediately. You know, things immediately happen, okay? What does the problem of time have to do? The fulfillment of time or the, the discussion of time have to do with preaching the gospel of God? Why connect it to time? We know about space and time. Is time simply a matter of discussion of physics? The, the promise occurred in Genesis, didn't it? Uh, the first three chapters where we find uh, the promise is made to, to Eve that her descendant will have a battle with a serpent and the serpent will wound him, but the serpent will be severely uh, injured and, and ultimately um, put out of business. But time was important because we don't have as much time as we want. But what amount of time do we have? Huh, who controls time? God does. So we have the amount of time that he allows us to have. Now, if we think we have all the time in the world, uh, how is that going to affect how we live? If we think that there's no limit to time, what might we neglect? Telling others. Pardon me? And repenting, getting prepared for who he is. That's what John was doing. Get prepared. He's coming. The Messiah's coming. In order to get prepared, they needed to know the time of waiting is over. Now it's necessary uh, to respond. We don't have all the time in the world. We only have that time which God gives us, and he doesn't tell us how much time we have. So we need to be careful and look at what Jesus is, is saying to them here. He's showing them that there's an urgency to the gospel. Why is the gospel connected to urgency? If you've not obeyed the gospel, how long do you have? How much time do you have to obey? Yes, we, we don't know, only God knows, okay? If, if we think that time doesn't matter, perhaps we'll not take seriously the responsibility that we have to listen to what John the Baptist said and to what Jesus said after him. Uh, it, was a, it was a peak in their history, as several have mentioned from the time of Genesis. Jewish people had been looking maybe for 400 years for the coming of the Messiah and a prophet who would introduce him. And Jesus tells them, as John did, the time is now. The waiting is over. It's about time for the Messiah uh, to come. So it was a peak time in the history of Israel. What did the leaders think about that? Just another day, just another problem, just a big mouth man has to be stopped. Uh, you know, it was a political thing. They were not realizing that they were in the peak of their history. Jesus did what to the nation of Israel? He flipped it. That's a good way to look at it. In, in what way did Jesus flip the nation of Israel? Yes. The old covenant was ending. A new one was coming. Okay. So this was an important thing to, for them to know. They didn't know it. They weren't paying attention. They saw Jesus not as 
someone bringing good news or even uh, a, a kingdom they would like, they saw Jesus as what? Troublemaker, he's a threat. Do politicians sometimes today consider Christ and his people a threat? I hear heads shaking. There's a little sloshing going on up there, right? Yes, they do. <laughs> yes, they do. Why would they consider Jesus a political threat and his disciples? John? They were the elite, so now they're part of the common. Yes. So, so Jesus represented power. He represented it then, okay? And they were concerned that they would lose their power, uh, not only from a, you know, that personal jealousy type thing, because obviously people are following John and then they're following Jesus. That threatened them. Uh, but more than their ego, they were concerned about Rome. So he's changing things, and politicians pay attention to who has power over the people. Yes? Take care of the Roman situation, too, because if they got the Romans ticked off at them, then they would have a problem, a real big problem. Exactly. And they would lose their power there, too, as well. Yes. Or they'd change it around, you know, whatever. And, and this is, of course, from their perspective. If what Jesus claimed was true, how would it turn things upside down or flip things around? If it was true, what was, what was expected of the Messiah, how would that have benefited the leaders of Israel? The thought was he was coming back and going to establish the kingdom and going to kick the Romans out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they could have looked at it from a different perspective. But the challenge was our own personal concerns sometimes get in the way of what's better or what's best. But in this situation, if he's coming to establish a kingdom, it, it might have been a positive idea. We find out, though, as he defended himself to Pilate, what he, how he viewed his kingdom. How did he view it? Why was he not a threat to Rome? It wasn't of this world. Then why do people of this world today still consider Jesus a threat? Because we are what Mark wants us to be. We are followers. Okay, and followers tend to have a commitment to Jesus, and this threatens political powers. And so you will find frequently that even in our own country, those people who have a faith are criticized and made fun of and the butt of jokes and ridicule. So this is a, a way of discouraging people from making that choice. But in fact, it has been that way since the time that Jesus was there uh, in Jerusalem. So let's look then as we go through verse 15, not only is it the peak of history, but Jesus reveals that his kingdom was near in verse 15, and he tells us the specific parts of his gospel. What do we learn about his gospel? At least three things there in verse 15. What do you see? The gospel of God includes what? Well, let's start with the good news is the kingdom of God. Why is the kingdom of God good news? Is it good news? The kingdom of God? Why? It's for everyone, not just the Jews. And, you know, the reason I'm asking these questions is because these are the kinds of things that people who have no knowledge of the Bible or no faith in Jesus might be curious to know from you. These are things that they may ask about. Why, why is there an advantage to the kingdom of Jesus? What does Jesus show that, that would distinguish his kingdom from the kingdoms of the world? Let me ask you, go back a thousand years and then just count back 6,000 years. How many of those empires exist today? None. About 500 years ago. None. The dirt is still there. The dirt where they stood is still there. And in some places, the monuments are still there. But the empires of the world have come and gone. What about the kingdom of Jesus? It's forever. It's a forever kingdom and a forever king. So we begin to see the good news is the kingdom of God is at hand and it's different. 
different and mighty and amazing ways. It's a fulfillment of prophecies. Uh, and the, the Gospels, just in the Gospels, the writers speak of the fact that the kingdom came and the kingdom is still here. So that was good news. The kingdom of God is a God that is a kingdom that is reliable. It has a king who can be trusted, okay? When Jesus gave his word, guess what? Yes, he didn't have to hire a lawyer to have the wording written in a special way. His word, you could trust. And so this is the kind of kingdom and the kind of king that would be a blessing to us and a blessing uh, to the world. What's the, the first thing about the good news that we see here that we've not talked about yet? To get into the kingdom, you must repent. Okay, this is what was uh, the me- part of the message of, of John the Baptist, of course. So what does repent mean? Uh, there were, I, I met people when I was in Slovakia and we'd studied the Bible and we had Bible classes in Slovak and Bible classes in English. I taught the ones in English amongst other people. And oftentimes they would tell me they preferred to study the Bible in English. And I said, why is that? And they said, because our country's culture has taken the words in Slovak and and given them to a particular religion. Their money had religion on it. Their monuments, everything had religion on it. And they said, "I, I finally feel that I can use a word that's true and accurate to what is taught in the New Testament. But what's the problem with that? How are you going to teach your people, your neighbors? You've got to learn how to take the Slovak word and explain it according to the revelation of God's word. So how would you explain repent? What does repent mean? Turn away from, this is the key idea. They were taught that repent was sorrow. You felt sorry, okay? Uh, And yet, if you look, for example, in the the Greek dictionary, it has nothing to do with that. It's not that there is no need for being sorry, but the word is metanoel. How do you say that? Uh, That's uh, metanoel, means to change the mind. Okay, so... Whenever we say that word, think of what he said, because I can see the letters, but I don't pronounce them very well. That, it's made of two words, meta, which means change of place or, or condition, and noeo, however he said that, which means to exercise the mind, to think, to comprehend. And so it means to change the mind, and? Well, the implication is that the behavior will follow. Behavior the, will follow. The, those are related, but the... Uh, the core idea of the word itself is the, that it starts in the thinking. And it reminds me of like what Paul said in Romans 12. Uh-huh. Uh, we're renewed in the, the spirit of our mind. Yes. Or, uh, or transformed uh, by the renewing of the mind. Yeah. Uh, there, and so the, the transformation happens, uh, or it begins in our thinking. Yeah. And the, the idea in the gospel here of what's being, or what's being taught is that a changed way of thinking leads to a changed behavior. This so, is the key. You know, and I, I like what you mentioned there about the, um, you're talking about the sorrow. Uh-huh. I like how Paul ties this, that, that repentance isn't the sorrow, but godly sorrow leads to the repentance. Let's look at that passage. That's an important passage. Is it 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8 through 11? Would someone like to read that? For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Uh, Though I did regret it, for I see that the letter caused you sorrow, though only for a while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that's according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For behold, the, for behold what earnest, uh, earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you, what vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. In everything, you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. Okay, this shows us the difference between the sorrow and the repentance, because they're both here. He, he, he tells them that he regrets that they were sor- sorrowful, but they needed to be sorrowful because of what they had done. 
So he goes on to tell them that the sorrow, sorrowful attitude or the sorrowful feeling leads to what? Repentance. So it can't be repentance. It's something that can lead to repentance, but repentance is the turning, the turning of the mind, the turning uh, of the thinking. And when you do that, it leads to salvation. All right. So this is what I was wanting to point out to, to us. When we look at the, the, the gospel of God, the message that Jesus introduces here, he tells them that they need to repent. Of course, John had done the same thing. So those coming into the kingdom needed to repent. In Mark chapter 1, verse 5, if you look up there at Mark chapter 1, verse 5, what else does, he, does uh, John require of them? Yes, and before that? Yeah, while that, those two are going on, it says, and all the country of Judea was going out to him and all the people of Jerusalem, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Okay, what does confess your sins mean? You, you say that you sinned. You may even specifically confess the sins or sin that you're on. That means you admit it, that you have uh, done this sin. And it, the, the, the word confess has multiple meanings. When you are uh, in a trial and you're confessing something, it may not be that you've committed a sin. The, the idea of confess can have what meaning? Tell anything, right? You could tell anything, not necessarily your sins, all right? But in this particular case, they are confessing their sins because he says it in particular. Uh, it's different than simply telling the truth and the whole truth. Although, if you're going to, to be honest and have integrity about it, confessing your sins would need to be the whole truth. So they were, uh, they were repenting, they were confessing, and we find out they were being baptized. But in, in Mark's summary of what Jesus teaches about his gospel, repent means to turn, it means to, to change, to return to God. In fact, there's another word translated repent, that is distinguished from this one. This word is to, to turn away from the negative, to turn away from something. And there's another, epestrefo, 1994, that means to turn toward something. He's gonna get his Greek out here. That's why I like to ask these uh, Greek specialists. To repent or, or to change the mind. In fact, if you will turn to Acts chapter three, verse 19, both words are found in that verse. Uh, it says, therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So there is a sense in our word repent that's positive, but it's not the same one that we're finding in the Greek here that was part of Jesus's gospel. That's the first word in Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Therefore, repent and return. That second word is also uh, possible to translate repent. Re, uh, but the first one is what you're turning away from, and the second one is what you're turning toward, typically from what I saw in the Greek. But it may have a better, we may get a, a better explanation of the differences of them. We don't want to confuse them. We turn away from what is negative, and we turn towards uh, what is positive, and that's what he's telling them here. Repent, turn, change, return to God, uh, if you want to use uh, both of those words. But what I wanted us to, to understand, that the words that we have here in, in our Bible that come from the Greek have gotten their spiritual or religious content uh, from the Jewish and Christian thought. So it was the Jewish and Christian practitioners that gave the, the direction that these words would go from a spiritual point of view, from what I can see. They say that the Greeks didn't have this idea in their culture, but that the, the Jewish people and the Christian people did. So you turned away from sin and you turned towards God, or even if you want to see it as one motion, away from sin and toward God. Yes, sir. We're in Acts 3, verse 19. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So we've looked at the, the good news is the kingdom of God. It involves repentance, and it also involves believing in the gospel. So what does it mean to believe? 
Hmm. If you believe in something, what does that say? You're ready to take action. This is something you trust or have confidence in, and therefore ready uh, to take action. And so he tells them to believe in the gospel. So the gospel message becomes true and trustworthy, something that, that they would accept. And in this particular case, it's good news about Jesus. It involves a belief that he is right, and all that he says and does is right, and he becomes the, the focus. Uh, of our relationship with God. So these are basic things, and you may find as you talk with people, especially those who don't have a background, that their idea uh, of how these words work in spiritual context is different. So it, you might need to take some time, as it, it was with me in, in Slovakia, where I had to show them it was a decision of the mind and not an emotion that he was talking about here. In our modern times, what questions might we need to answer for people to believe in the gospel? If we're asking them, believe in the gospel, trust it. Take it as your guide for what is real and true. What might we need to say in addition to the things which Mark has recorded? How is our time different from their time? What might we need to add uh, in order to help people to believe in the gospel? Is there anything? Think about the typical question that a person who's not experiencing the gospel might ask you, like, how do you know that's reliable word? How do you know that's what it really says? How do you know that these things are true? Yes, Paul? I want to say that, you know, one of the things that we have to tell them is faith cometh by hearing okay. and hearing of the word of God, because that's the only thing that's going to bring the faith to you is that when you read it and believe it, put faith in it. That's the point. That's what I tell people. Yes, this is a, the fundamental thing that he's saying here. There is an assumption uh, with his culture that may not be true of ours. For example, is there a way to know that the text we have in our Bible is reliable? Sure. Yeah, well, you can look at fulfilled prophecies. For example, if you have never seen one, I have this list of uh, prophecies concerning Jesus that were fulfilled, and what is the statistical possibility that those prophecies could all be fulfilled in one person if God was not involved? And it becomes a pretty amazing statistic. It's some huge number. I'm looking at 1 in 10 to the 28th power. That's a big number. One, that's one with 28 zeros after it. That's how unlikely it could be by chance, or if you want to look at it the other way, how likely it would be true because of God's intervention. Anyway, this is something you could, you could share with people just about prophecy. As Bill says, the prophecy shows the reliability of it. This one description of fulfillment of prophecy shows that statistically speaking, that the fulfillment of prophecies concerning Christ is reliable. It would be unusual with those statistics for it to, to not be true. But you can also do other things. For example, you can look at how many manuscripts there are of the Word of God. Some, what, more than 10,000 portions or uh, check, c collections of manuscripts, and they can be compared. So there's a whole area of what we call apologetics that, uh, that would be uh, useful today for people who don't have a confidence that the Bible is God's Word. If they're going to know Jesus, they have to read it, they have to see it, they have to hear uh, what he had to, to say. The idea that we are becoming disciples assumes a relationship, and that's one of the things that we have to be careful of, that we're not committing people to a church or to a doctrine. We're committing them to what? Jesus, a person, and his Father, and the Holy Spirit. So those other things occur. If you're committed to Jesus, then you're committed to his church, and you're committed to his teaching. But it's not the reverse. It starts with the relationship of a person. Yes? The teaching in the Bible is to get us in a relationship with Christ. Now, we're baptized into Christ, and we're given of our sins, yes. That starts the relationship. But we have to 
uh, create a relationship. Like Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, to those who said, I can't, we cast out demons, did all these things, miracles, etc." He says, away from me, you lawless. I never knew you. So they did not have a relationship with him in that mm -hmm. situation. That's what that word means, a relationship with Christ. And we learn that through the word. Yes. And he and said start there the practicing it physically. Yes. That's right. He said the reason they didn't have a relationship with him is because they were not practicing the truth. Yeah. So you, you, you can claim anything. And that's what they were doing. They were claiming that they did all these things. Jesus didn't say they did or they didn't. He just said, depart from me. You do not practice the truth. But anyway, the idea that Paul's saying is important to remember. We start with relationship with Jesus, and that's what Mark is trying to do. He's trying to answer who is Jesus in order that we might develop a relationship with him. And when we develop that relationship and we develop a trust in him and a love for him, that becomes a motivation. You can keep the word of God out of guilt. Lots of people do. But it doesn't last very long. If you keep the word of God out of love, that's a different motivation. And this is what we're being moved towards, towards learning who Jesus is and loving him, and therefore making a choice about how we live. In verse 16, he will go by the Sea of Galilee, and there he will find a number of men that he will call uh, to come to follow him. And this is the key uh, idea that Mark is getting across, is that Jesus is calling people. He's calling them to follow him, not just to know him, and not just to benefit from his power, but to follow him. And that will help us as we understand the message of Mark to see where we need to be. Are we, in, in fact, following Jesus? So. We are out of time. I, I would like to spend a little more time on the, the call of the first disciples, and it, it'll take a little more time than, than we have. I'd like you to think about th this during the week as you consider the gospel, uh, uh, chapter one in Mark, and the message that Jesus has shared through Mark today. What is Jesus committing to? when he calls us to be his disciples and follow him. We often look at what we are committing to, okay? But think about it. what is Jesus committing to when he calls us to follow him? Because we're gonna to get to that story at the end of Mark, all right? What is Jesus committing to? And that's something uh, to think about. Okay, shall we close in a word of prayer? Father, we thank you for this time that we've had to discuss the gospel that Jesus presented. And we're thankful, Father, for your mercy and kindness and giving us this word that we can go back and, and look through it and, and understand what you revealed through your son. Thank you for him. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for uh, working through those uh, resources we have in this world to help people to know who you are. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.